Hi, this is Kenny Johnson. I'm the executive producer and creator of the Incredible Hulk television series. And on this particular epic, Prometheus, I was also the writer and director. And I'll be telling you about uh, what it was like to make that movie. We've uh, never had an opportunity to talk about the main title of The Incredible Hulk. I, I knew that uh, I wanted it to start with uh, the word danger. But when I was in Alan Mark's editing room, looking at it on the moviola, I realized that I could push in a little bit and start with a word that was even more important to The Incredible Hulk, and that word is anger, and then pull out and show danger. Then we had to try in a very short time to tell all the backstory of The Incredible Hulk, and I was honored that Mad Magazine once did a send-up of our main title of The Hulk, which was particularly funny. Unfortunately, I've lost it over the years, so if anybody out there has a copy, I would sure love to see it. I'll tell you at the end of this commentary how to, uh, how to get in touch with me. There's a shot that's coming up uh, in just a moment here, a lightning flash right about there. That's a stock footage shot from the Paramount Stock Footage Library, which we had to pay for every single time it aired on The Incredible Hulk for all 81 hours. The Incredible Hulk was, of course, created in the comic book world by Stan Lee, uh, the genius of that genre. And I was very gratified that uh, Stan was particularly pleased with the way that I had adapted The Incredible Hulk for television. And we've been fast friends for uh, all these 30 years ever since then. And I also realized in the editing room that I could marry the shot of Bix and Lou together in what became this iconic shot right there, the two sides of the one guy. Prometheus, of course, was the god who stole fire from the gods and gave it to humans and was punished terribly for it. And it seemed like an appropriate title for this particular context of this show. We started shooting Prometheus on April the 14th, 1980, and wrapped 20 days later on May 9th, 1980. We had a little, about four extra days because it was a big season opener and it was a very expensive show. It was about $800,000 per hour, which uh, was pretty big money in those days. I hope you like dessert. This uh, scene at NORAD was actually shot on uh, stage 41 at Universal on day 15 on the 2nd of May. It was a Friday. I was there working with um, uh, this young lady, Jill Chowder, and John O'Connell. John had been in a uh, Hulk episode a year or two previously for us, and I liked his work a lot, and, uh, and brought him back for here. Um, it was uh, an important uh, setup for the fact that there was a national situation here, that the government was already uh, on the case here, and something was uh, up that nobody was, uh, was quite expecting or quite knowing what it was. Uh, the camera angles are low, the lighting is uh, dim, done by John McPherson, my longtime friend and cinematographer, and uh, Jack Schlosser, our uh, gaffer, key lighting technician. Uh, the first close-up right there uh, of John as he begins to uh, get to the uh, point of, uh, well, what else could it be if it's uh, not a meteor? What else could it be? <laughs> like that. I wanted to do a, a particularly big opening for Prometheus to sort of bring the audience into it as quickly as possible in, in a kind of big way. And a few years earlier, I had done a show called Doomsday is Tomorrow on the Bionic Woman, uh, where we used some stock footage from Paramount of water rushing. And the footage came from a movie that Alan Pakula had done in 1974 called The Parallax View. Uh, if you rent that movie, you will see this footage and how it was used there. I'll sort of talk you through it here now. Uh, Bix is standing in the Tahunga Wash on the East uh, San Fernando Valley. Notice the size of the rock that he's standing on and how far it is out of the water. Here's coming up is the shot from the parallax view. Notice what Bix is wearing, that blue outfit. See that blue outfit there? Well, that's not Bix. That's a stuntman in Georgia for the parallax view where this dam is located. He was doubling for Warren Beatty, who got into a fight with a, uh, a sheriff uh, who was wearing khaki clothes. So uh, to make it work, we uh, put Bix in the same costume that the stuntman was wearing. And all of this big water footage is from the parallax view. And now notice when the camera tilts down here how uh, the water is coming up because uh, the water is pouring out of here. Well, we couldn't make the water come up in the Hunga Wash because it was only one level. So what we had to do instead was, of course, lower the rock. 
we made three different size rocks, the tall one that you saw first, the second one, and now we're down to the third one, which has got his feet in the water. So the water level hasn't changed, just the, uh, the lowering of the rock into the water. The water was being stirred up there in the Tahunga Wash by some pumps that uh, Tommy Reba and his special effects crew were manning for just off camera. So we were cutting between, uh, between Bix and the stock footage here. Then he begins to hear somebody shouting downstream who will turn out to be Laurie Prang. A little music cue in from Joe. Uh, again, stock footage of the water rushing down. And uh, this is sort of a dangerous thing that Bix is doing here, running over this broken ground. Uh, but he knew I was going to see his face, and he really asked me to uh, if he could do it, as opposed to Frank Orsati, our stunt coordinator, who often doubled Bix in a situation like this. And Joe's music is beginning to ramp up the, uh, the energy. And you know, you'll notice what Lori Prang is wearing. She's in khaki. Well, that's because the fight that uh, ensued in the parallax view involved uh, Warren Beatty's stunt double in the blue outfit and uh, the sheriff's stunt double in the khaki outfit. Um, and so we matched the costuming. Brienne, our costume designer, matched them. And this little piece of water where they are right here was the only actual piece of white water we had to work with at Tahunga Wash. It was the only place where the water churned up a little bit. And so we, we kept using it over and over again. Here they fall into the water. Uh, now they're going down through the same 10, 12 feet of water over and over again. But in close-ups, you can't tell. We cut to the stock footage wide. You see the people struggling in the water there. And you can't even tell that it's not a woman in the khaki outfit. Uh, when you use a piece of stock footage like that, of course, you pay for it by the foot. And if there's a stunt involved, uh, then you have to pay the stuntman, which we did in this case. We had to pay both of the stuntmen who, um, who did the gag originally down in Georgia. But it gave us a, a very, very big look uh, as Bix and Laurie keep going down <laughs> through the same piece of white water over and over. Um, but intercut with the stock footage, it made the picture open a lot bigger than it possibly could have if I'd had to do it uh, just on a TV budget and uh, uh, settle for that. We're in a little more calm place downstream now as we finished off the sequence here. Bix and Laurie are both wearing thin wetsuits underneath their costumes uh, because this was snowmelt water. It was freezing. I myself was in a full wetsuit. This was on the 23rd of April uh, in 1980. It was a Wednesday. It was our eighth day of filming. And Bix and Laurie did, uh, did just a tremendous job uh, struggling through the water for us. When I had done The Incredible Hulk originally, uh, my, my deal that I worked out with Universal was that I would do The Hulk for them if I could do a uh, four-hour miniseries of Ivanhoe. I had always wanted to do a big classic piece like that. I had written the script for Ivanhoe, and when I wrote it, I was looking to give it a sort of a classical kind of feel. And I looked at a lot of films, and uh, The Lion in Winter jumped out at me. The dialogue had such a wonderful flow to it, and I, I wasn't quite sure why that was the case. When I went and looked carefully at the script for The Lion in Winter, I saw that it was all written in iambic meter. All the dialogue went ba-bum, 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 the same meter that Shakespeare had written in. Not in verse, it wasn't broken into pentameter, but it was in meter. And I had written Ivanhoe that way, and, uh, and I sort of had it in my head when I got to Prometheus, and I thought, gee, I wonder if I can write contemporary dialogue that was also in iambic meter without having it sound sort of, you know, corny or phony or strange. And I uh, made a stab at it here on Prometheus. And all the dialogue from the very beginning to the very end is written in iambic meter. What does that mean? That means that the internal rhythm of the words is very important to me. And if you listen to them talk, you'll hear, you'll hear how it works. Most every word has a syllable that is emphasized, and you just have to think about that when you're constructing the dialogue. Listen. Alphabet, cream of mushroom, or consomme? And quite a memory. I've got no choice. I've got no choice. Ba bum ba bum. Which would you recommend? Which would you recommend? Ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum. Chicken noodle. I would love the chicken noodle. See what I mean? It's a very subtle thing, but what it does is it gives the dialogue a, a wonderful sort of flow. 
Um, and I ended up using the same technique when I wrote the miniseries V. All of uh, my original miniseries V is in uh, iambic meter also. Ba bum, ba bum, ba bum. And it's funny, the actors in V would come to me and say, gee, I, you know, it's so strange. This dialogue is so easy to memorize. I don't understand why. Well, part of the reason was because of the meter that it was in. Iambic is, is also um, like the heartbeat. Ba bum, ba bum. You know, so it's, uh, it's internal to all of us. This cabin interior was shot on stage 21 at Universal over two days, Monday and Tuesday, uh, the 21st and 22nd of April, um, with a little uh, outside the windows there. You can see some trees and, uh, and a green um, backdrop. But uh, the exterior of it was shot on the back lot at Universal. And notice the teacup on the left-hand side of frame. It's been in several of the shots already you may have seen. It's uh, sort of foreshadowing. Um, in this scene, we get this, the backstory on Laurie and the fact that she has sort of given up her career as a, as a concert pianist and uh, come to hide in the woods and, and tried to do her best to get around a little bit, but it hasn't worked out very well. Uh, and she has a very strong character arc in this. Um, whenever you're doing a, uh, an episodic television show, you try to want to show how the guest cast is affected by encountering your, uh, your lead. And in, in the case of this story, Bix helps to turn Laurie's character around entirely and uh, helps her get back into the, uh, into the world. Notice the teacup big time, because she's about to turn and forget it's there. First couple of times we've gone to close-ups here too. I tend to play things a little wider in uh, in my work on television than a lot of television directors do. People feel that television is a close-up medium and they have to be right on the faces all the time. I find that uh, it's much more interesting to come at it with a cinematic eye, using wider shots and two shots and three shots and letting the actors work within the frame a little more. Uh, I just feel that it's, uh, I don't know, I've always shot everything in television that way. And now we're about to go down to uh, the place where Bill knows he has been and caused a little trouble in the past. Uh, and this was actually the, the very last shot right here that we made in the movie. This was scene 38. The camera slate is on my wall at home. And this is Lou Palter, who was one of my instructors when I was in the drama department at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, and lose an old dear friend who became the uh, Dean of Students at, uh, at California Institute of the Arts. If you saw the movie Titanic, you might remember the heartbreaking scene where old Isidore Strauss and his wife die in the bed together as the water comes up around them. Well, that was Louis playing Strauss. And now this stock footage of um, Palomar Observatory takes us uh, back into our NORAD uh, and a big close-up of, uh, of Jill Choder. Um, Jill uh, had been on Mod Squad and Law and & Order and a bunch of other shows. Uh, and John O'Connell uh, had uh, done Wonder Woman and had a recurring role on Hill Street Blues and Airwolf and L.A. Law and also appeared on Married with Children, things like that. Wonderful actors all. And they all uh, uh, really jumped in and learned the, the dialogue for me because it was important to get the lines exactly right, obviously, since we were uh, playing with iambic. And if somebody wanted to change a line in the course of the filming, it would take me a few minutes on the set to figure out how to say it and say it the way that I wanted to. Um, we see our cylindrical object coming, a little ode to H.G. Uh, Wells and War of the Worlds, and now the phone that it takes a key to unlock. So uh, we are making our first contact with Prometheus, which remains a mysterious entity throughout this first hour of uh, Prometheus. But clearly it's, uh, it's big time and it's important and uh, you know, when the phone was locked up, obviously it has to be important. There's the big object coming in the effects guys put together for me, and that took us to our commercial. And now we come back from commercial, reminding you that the LEO object is uh, closing in. It's 53,000 miles, now it's 51,000 miles, getting closer all the time. Sort of a nice framing here with Jill in the background and the uh, object uh, looming. I love looking down on helicopters. I think it's so cool. Of course, you have to have two helicopters in order to do that, which we did on this second day of filming on uh, Pine Tree Road on the back lot. Uh, the chopper on the right there actually has the camera in it that was taking the shot that you just saw. There's another camera inside the tent looking back at the same time here. That would be this camera as uh, Roger Robinson picks up the phone. You can see the camera on the, other, on the distant chopper that just landed there. It's a Tyler mount uh, in the doorway of the helicopter, which Prometheus would would have had as part of their equipment, so I was able to show it on screen as well. 
Roger Robinson is a, uh, a wonderful, solid actor who uh, had done Ironsides and was a regular on Kojak and ER. He'd been on Dukes of Hazard, NYPD Blue, a whole slew of features. They're inbound now. And he's um, sort of setting up uh, their, their fact that they're going to hand off this whole thing to Prometheus. Uh, I was a big fan of Michael Crichton's Andromeda Strain, and I thought that the government must have some sort of contingency plan for dealing with extraterrestrials. I mean, mustn't they? We would, we would think they would. And that's what I posited and came up with the idea for Prometheus. And here's, of course, our intrepid reporter, Jack McGree, saying, what's Prometheus? I love the big red truck behind him. We decided that red was going to be one of the prime Prometheus colors. Dana Crocker, our transportation guy, found that great truck for me and uh, coordinated with Lou Montahano, our art director, to, uh, to blend it in with uh, all the rest of the, uh, the work that we used. The costumes and the jumpsuits put together for Prometheus were all done by Brienne Glytoff, our longtime costume designer. She'd done Columbo and she did V for me and uh, Dr. Quinn, medicine woman. Uh, the onset folks were Jerry Heron and Diana Wilson. Diana has probably got more credits than anybody I know. V, Private Ryan, Sixth Sense, Castaway, Contact, Gump, you know, Forrest Gump, Death Becomes Her. Diana works all the time. Wonderful folks. And we saw the little um, emblem of Prometheus, and now he sees radiation hazard. Now he sees this big flatbed truck, which we're going to see later on. A little setup there. <laughs> I always thought Jack looked a little drunk there, staggering out of the way of that uh, Jeep. But Jack was a just a tremendous, solid actor uh, that I was so pleased to be able to bring on to the show. And I was looking to get Jack into this uh, and let him sort of become our eyes that took us into the world of Prometheus, which is appropriate because he is uh, an investigative reporter after all, albeit for a um, tabloid uh, sort of sleeve newspaper, but that uh, set it up. This is the back lot at Universal, uh, when there was a back lot at Universal. Uh, now it's all been torn apart and rebuilt uh, to accommodate the tours. There were different little sections of it. This was the section called Hideout Ranch, you know, where the bad guys go for the hideout in the cabin. And this is an important scene in the picture because it's uh, where Bix's character, Dr. David Banner, begins to affect the life of the woman that he has encountered here. Uh, he's helping her to realize that she can find her way around. If she's, if she's mindful of where the sun is, if she feels the warmth of the sun on her face, and what happens if there's no sun, then uh, there are other, other clues that he can teach her. And not only is it an example of the wonderful altruistic nature of Dr. David Banner, and shows how their relationship develops and how he changes her life because of that. But it also becomes a key point in the story later on when Lori finds herself alone in the forest and has to find her way back to the cabin. And David's character has helped her to do that. Again, notice the lack of close-ups here. It's, it's in two shots, uh, almost the whole piece. Uh, that's because I really wanted them to uh, be in a relationship, and, and I always try to do that in two shots wherever I can, as opposed to single, single, single. Um, this was the first day of filming, and Bix came in knowing the words pretty well, but not really well, and I was really annoyed with him. I said, man, I crafted this stuff because I really want to try this iambic thing. Uh, now, please go back to your trailer and learn the lines, and when you're ready, then we'll do it. And bless his heart, he did. And from then on, he had the lines down pat and really did it up royal for me. Uh, Bix and I had a great relationship throughout the entire shooting of, of the whole series. Uh, he was uh, never a jerk. We would have knockdown, drag out battles sometimes, but they were always over the things that were important and story points rather than ego and that sort of thing. Yes, you did. He was a first-rate guy, and I miss him so much to this day still. He was a dear heart and a good guy and a thorough professional and always a helpmate to the people that he met in the stories. But little does he know what's coming. The Leo object is screaming in at us now in this little visual effect. Not too bad for 1980. And taking us back to uh, NORAD, uh, sort of a nice shot I liked here where we saw the big screen and coming in over India and then John leans into screen right over on top of us there. A little f smoke going on in the background there as we'll hear. Listen to the iambic dialogue here. 
Computers reconfirming the trajectory predicted. You know what I mean? Traducer, you know, it's uh, it's kind of fun, nice and smooth. And I had to add a little bit of fog there over Roger Robinson so that we get the sense that they were socked in so that they weren't really flying around and looking for what was happening or why weren't they on the case a little sooner. I had to hold back the arrival of the military gang uh, so that Bix would have the opportunity to uh, get into real trouble before they uh, before they got there. Captain Welsh, it's over North America. I really like the artwork that uh, Lou Montahano and his guys gave me here to work with the big screen in the background and um, John playing in the foreground. I know that people who are blind tend to have an additional sort of sense that happens to them, um, and not only sound, but just overall sensitivity. And I wanted to play that with Laurie here, which she plays very interestingly. She pulls him to a stop. She senses something's coming. I then had two pigeon wranglers to let go a bunch of pigeons for me here, as though the animals had sensed it too. This is a really terrible special effect there. Oh my god. Uh, a little camera shake and some wind blowing, courtesy of the big wind machines from uh, Tommy Reba and Jeff Frank and the vision, special effects crew. Uh, a little more rough, and, and of course it also helps to emphasize the fact that uh, she can't see what's going on and it makes her crazy and it's just, she's such an angry woman at this point. And uh, Lori really, really captured that and, and uh, got exactly what I was looking for. The cabin shot that you just saw is on the back lot at Universal, and that's why it's called Hideout Cabin, as you can guess. There's no interior to that cabin. And again, a two-shot as she apologizes to Bix uh, and his arm around her and the relationship and the closeness, um, much more effective in, uh, in the two-shot than it would have been with a big, fat close-up of her and him, something that I'm always trying to do. Did it a lot on the Alien Nation movies, particularly. And now we're cutting to Indian Dunes, which is an area uh, in Valencia near uh, Magic Mountain Amusement Park, if you know where that is, uh, north of Los Angeles. It was a large open area back in the 80s, which we sort of used as an extension of the back lot at Universal. We were always uh, out here at Indian Dunes filming something or other when we needed sort of wilderness. Obviously, if a, if a big object landed, it would create a huge crater, and we didn't want to try to deal with that. So I said, well, suppose it came in and sort of glanced along down a hillside and slid down to where it finally came to rest. It was a bit of a stretch, but we'd also tried to set up earlier on in the dialogue that it was almost as though it was being piloted, so we didn't know quite what we were dealing with. But Lou Matahano and his art direction set decoration crew turned the whole hillside there. We painted it black. It wasn't really burned black. You have to be very careful with fires out in this area. Everything had to be very, very carefully controlled so that we wouldn't uh, do any real damage. And we brought along a number of our own trees that we could set on fire. If you look at the tree that's coming up here in just a moment, you'll see that right beside the tree is a, is a little pole uh, with fire coming out. See right there, the tree, and then to the left of the tree is a little pole. That's a pipe with a propane gas coming out of it so that uh, we can control the fire and turn it on and off exactly when we need it. The rock, uh, the meteor, of course, was hollow uh, so that um, we could have our special effects guys inside and generating some steam coming out of it. Uh, the art team uh, managed to make it uh, a little sparkly for me. I said I wanted it to have some life, and that's one of the trees that we brought so that it could fall. Again, two cameras, one wide and one close on Bix as it falls down in. And already Bix is beginning to, to show something's wrong. You can see it's more than just the smoke. There's something wrong. He can feel it. And, but he doesn't know quite what it is. What he's going to learn, of course, ultimately, is that there's a lot of gamma radiation coming off of this meteor. And we know what that means to Dr. David Banner. That's how he got into this mess to begin with, by overdosing himself because of his obsession to uh, find the hidden strengths that all humans have. And here, Bix had to play simply, internally, no way to do it in dialogue, that something was really, really bothering him here. And I tried to get the uh, meteor into the foreground here in a big way so that it sort of loomed over him as he approached it. And Joe's music, swirling and, and strange, uh, is also helping to set up the mood and the, the sense of what we're doing. Uh, all of the smoke and such, of course, obviously added by uh, the effects crew. 
When I was doing episodes of JAG in recent years, I met a brilliant young assistant director named Kevin Coster, who was a big fan of The Incredible Hulk, and he had made a list of every reason that Dr. David Banner ever hulked out. It was wonderful. And on this one, uh, he said, Kenny, what did David think was going to happen when he kicked a uh, hornet's nest? Well, actually, see, Kevin, he didn't kick it. He tripped over it and fell into it, and it was on the tree that had fallen down earlier. We added a lot of foreground hornets and bees here in visual effects later on and stuck some on Bix's face so that we could really get a sense of what was going on. The inserts of the, sh of the, the Hulk out and the ripping clothes and everything was always done later on by our associate producer team, Stephen Caldwell and Alan Cassidy. Stephen Allen had the task of dealing with the real hornet's nest. I didn't have to deal with that on the day we were, we were filming out there, thanks, but no. This was on the 16th of April in, uh, in 1980. But I was looking to give Lou uh, some, some Hulk moments here, and so first of all, we got to really catapult the uh, hornet's nest. Tommy Reba had rigged up a catapult thing, and, uh, and then we did this little gag here where the tree comes down and Louie catches it and then uh, pushes it back up the other way and flips it over. It's actually, of course, being pulled over the other way by uh, the special effects crew on the set, Tommy Reba and Jeff Frank and uh, Greg Jensen. But uh, pretty effective. By the fourth season, Louie had really gotten inside this character and, and became quite a adept at uh, performing it without any uh, dialogue, of course. I, I didn't want Hulk speak like comic book sound funny, not want that. So I uh, avoided that, and uh, uh, Louis used to say to me sometimes, Kenny, why doesn't the Incredible Hulk have more dialogue? And I said, well, for one thing, Louis, he didn't come from Brooklyn like you do. Uh, his voice was done first by uh, Ted Cassidy, who does our main title narration, until Ted uh, unfortunately died in 1979. And then I enlisted the aid of Charlie Napier, a wonderful character actor whom you'd recognize immediately upon seeing his face. Charlie also had a voice that came from the center of the earth like Ted's did, and uh, Charlie would uh, do lose growls and moans and groans on the ADR stage uh, afterwards to, to put it all together. And then we'd even pitch it down lower so that it would be even lower than it was when it started out. Another little pull away tree gag there. And when we had this uh, on the uh, Moviola, I, I didn't think there was enough smoke, so uh, the guys in the editing room uh, added a little extra smoke for me to make the thing look even, uh, even creepier. And this took it to another commercial break. The show was generally done in four acts. There, generally, there was a Hulk out at the end of Act 2 and then another one at the end of, uh, of Act 4. This was uh, also done on uh, Pine Tree Road near the command post that Roger Robinson was manning. Uh, this is young Chip Johnson, no relation, uh, who was on Battlestar Galactica and the A-Team and Airwolf and L.A. Law, uh, playing a pilot here for us, and leaving Jack Colvin in the background there, uh, trying to figure out what's going on. And now we go to a little handheld camera work. Uh, ideally, it's supposed to suggest that it's subjective. It's you or the point of view of the person that's walking. In this case, it's the point of view of the creature, Lou, walking. Incidentally, we always called him the creature in the scripts. We never called him the Hulk. I couldn't deal with that word very well. But clearly, he's moving up on the, um, the cabin, and we hear Laurie playing a little bit of uh, Rachmaninoff on the inside. And then we'll... Um, cut inside to where she's uh, doing this very sort of angry piece. Look at the expression on her face. She's just so frustrated, and she just gets to the point that she can't take it anymore and just pounds the piano, boom, 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 to help, again, set up the fact that uh, she is a troubled, angry young woman. Anger, ah, the theme. Look at that. We always tried to work thematically in the show, and in this case, uh, the theme of this particular show also was anger on Laurie's part. She actually learned this little piece here so that I could start the camera in the close-up of her fingers playing the real piece and then take it up to her as she's trying to calm herself down and reevaluate her life, but she senses something. And her, her sense of being able to play the blindness is just really remarkable, I think. Uh, throughout. She, you really get the feeling, even without contact lenses or anything like that, that she really is blind. And the music comes in here as she hears the growl and doesn't know what's going on, and we don't know quite where we're headed. A big 14 millimeter lens, very high and wide, showing the whole scene as she stumbles backwards trying to get away from this whatever it is that she has no idea. 
a uh, terrifying situation for someone who is blind. And Lori just absolutely captured this, I think, for us. And again, we've stayed in her point of view, basically, uh, although she's blind, because we haven't seen yet either what it is, although those of us who know the show certainly can guess what it is. Very nice little camera move here and, and focus pull by M assistant camera Merv Becker or Chuck Colgrove. I'm not sure who exactly was on it at this point, but we go from her face as she's just grown into this big close-up to focus on her hand, and that then takes us around to, ah, what is this? She's not sure. Look at the tears. It's all real stuff. She pulls it out from the inside, and now the camera's dollying around on a little curve here to reveal our boy and what's going on here, as she has no idea, obviously. Uh, then we were into the transition situation where we had to do our morph, and we were still, unfortunately, in the 80s, there was no morphing technology such as there is now in CGI, and we always had to do the old Wolfman thing where we'd overlap the images and slide from one to the next, and I just never was very, very happy with it. Um, and in this case, of course, he doesn't go all the way back. Oops. Uh, that's one of the key surprises in this show, is that uh, he doesn't make the transformation back. And this is Rick Drayson, who was sort of our midway guy. I needed somebody with a bit of a bigger body than Bix, but not as big as Lou. And this is one of the things that I think doesn't work very well. And I'm very, I was very frustrated about it at the time. We just did not have time to get the makeup uh, the way that we wanted it so that they were a dead match. Uh, and I tried to just get off of... Uh, uh, Rick's face as quickly as I could. He was a lovely guy to work with, but the, I just didn't feel his makeup matched Bix's close enough. Nowadays, of course, we could take Bix's head and plant it on Rick's body, and uh, uh, maybe if I ever redo Prometheus, that's, uh, that's what I would, I would endeavor to do. Um, but I, uh, I needed that, uh, uh, that additional strength and weight so, to show that his body was halfway back, too, not, not just his face. And television screens, of course, in the 1980s were smaller than the they are now. You know, the biggest screen you could get in those days was about a 21-inch screen, and on that, it didn't play too badly. When you see it blown up on today's uh, screens, it, uh, well, it takes my head off and uh, really, you know, sort of makes me nuts and wish I, I wish I could fix it now. Um, writing this for Bix was also fun, too, because I had to write it with words that were simpler and uh, more childlike, more like the Hulk was, the, the, the angry child, uh, you know, out of control. And, and a, he has moments of where he's trying to get out of control, like here. And, and that's Rick, of course, standing up, the bigger body, and then cutting to Bix. Um, so Bix had to put on the prosthetic uh, face appliance, which makes his forehead and brow larger. Uh, the eyebrows, of course, uh, were added, and, uh, and the white eyes, which were always very, very difficult for Bix. He had sensitive eyes. And whenever he had to go into the white eyes, it was uh, it was in incredibly challenging for him, uh, very very com uncomfortable for the most part. And I was looking for something that he could see his reflection in that would be different, and uh, also that he could vent his rage on, as opposed to just a mirror, which was seemed too obvious. Uh, so I picked this, and and this little slow zoom going on here as he sees what's going on. I I tend to do that occasionally when I'm trying to just intensify the drama. Look at the tears coming out of. And his nose running. I mean, that's really coming from the inside. Oh, it was very, very powerful. And Bix just could get into those moments so well and so quickly. <laughs> That's the Tyler mount right there on the side of the helicopter, taking the shot that you're about to see in just a moment here. A little dolly down and uh, push in on Jack Colvin uh, to match this uh, dolly down and push in. As he's seeing these Prometheus guys uh, get on the helicopter and he gets the idea, oh, well, I got one of those, I'll put one on and see what I can do. Again, it gave, gave me a, an opportunity to get Jack into the, uh, into the middle of the Prometheus operation and become our eyes inside uh, uh, Prometheus. Uh, here comes the little convoy that we're going to see later in the picture as well. And this shot was taken from the Tyler mount in the camera chopper. 
Tyler was the, one of the first um, camera mounts that was available for camera choppers. It's a little bumpy nowadays. Nowadays they're rock steady and gyro stabilized and everything. But this is sort of an interesting shot here. This was made on our day two at the command post day. All of these shots, when you've got two helicopters, you want to get everything you can out of them while you've got them uh, because you're paying for them by the hour. And watch the second helicopter taking off right here on cue so that we get all that great production value. You just didn't see that in normal one-hour episodic television. Jack's about to have a conversation with Stack Pierce, wonderful actor here on the left. Been in uh, Mission Impossible back in 1972 in the streets of San Francisco. Uh, he worked with me on The Six Million Dollar Man and Bionic Woman and uh, uh, became my navigator in the Doomsday Show and worked in V with me as well. He had recurring roles on Hill Street Blues, 90210, and was in War Games and The Patriot. Wonderful, wonderful actor with a great, great deep voice. Man now, in back in our, our set uh, on stage uh, 21, the cabin interior uh, at uh, Universal, again, notice the, the fact that it's not just single singles, it's they're both in the picture all the time. There's a little slow creep going on here with both the dolly and the zoom to help intensify the drama as Bix explains to her what uh, has happened to him and how he ends up like this, but in a very simplistic kind of way, and she has realized that she has to talk to him very much as she would talk to uh, to a child. Down from the sky. Yes. And Johnny's lighting again is just so subtle and and lovely for uh, for a daytime uh, interior. Bix had been the one that suggested casting Laurie for this. Uh, Laurie had worked with us back in 1977 when we did the second two-hour Hulk movie that I wrote called a Death in the Family, in which she played a cripple, as a matter of fact. And now she has sent something else, and she's about to have a little interesting scene at the door here with um, Stack Pierce. The uh, cabin, of course, on the stage had no exterior, and the cabin on the, on the back lot at Universal had no interior. So we had to shoot this in two pieces. This is on the stage, looking over Stack's uh, shoulder into the, into the room, but the reverse angle um, was shot on the back lot right here, uh, looking out at the back lot with the trees and the trucks and all of that sort of stuff blowing, and uh, shot on, obviously, on different days, and. Uh, and cut together so that it looks like it's uh, all happening at the same time. Uh, but the actors were terrific. We had rehearsed ahead of time and knew what we were doing and uh, were able to, to piece it together so that you don't know. There's, uh, there's just no more set on either side of this shot. There's, you know, you're seeing the entire interior of the cabin uh, in that shot, and we've left uh, Bix in the closet, so to speak. Uh, I liked this shot particularly, uh, looking through the window as we left him alone and went into our uh, third commercial break. When we came back, we were on the back lot as uh, Stack Pierce was taking Laurie away. Stack incidentally went on to play one of the really bad guy aliens for me in V. Here's a handheld shot done by Rick Gunter, our camera operator, who went on to become quite a talented director of photography in his own right. He did St. Elsewhere, 90210, Charmed, a number of other shows here. Coming up is a real high angle shot uh, taken from the top of a camera crane uh, with a 14 millimeter lens uh, right here so that we can see the whole problem and also see Lori get out the back later on. Nowadays that would be done with a really lightweight crane and a remote camera head up on the top of it. Uh, when we shot it, it was on the top of a Chapman crane with three guys up there and a big uh, studio camera. Much more cumbersome than we can shoot nowadays and it's uh, made the point though, the point of the scene being the guys working in the front and Lori sneaking out the back. I had two cameras working this day. This one was down on the deck, the other one was up on top, uh, looking down from the camera crane. Uh, this on a longer lens there. And now Lori is gonna show us what she learned from Dr. David Banner, and I don't know where you were on April 14th, 1980, but right here was our very first shot, scene 118, taken on day one of principal photography in 1980, as Lori came in and clambered around and, and then felt the sunshine on her face the way that uh, David had shown her. And in case you didn't get it, we put in a big close-up of the sun. Uh, a little bit on the nose, perhaps, but uh, I also wanted a more troubled kind of feeling. Um, so we added the wind here, uh, courtesy of the special effects crew, uh, just to upset the, um, the scene a little bit and make it... Uh, 
a little more energetic. Uh, in the films of Akira Kurosawa, you will see the, the, the use of wind all the time. In The Seven Samurai, I think the wind is blowing in practically every scene, and it just adds an additional element, literally element, of, uh, of drama to the scene. But as you can see, she found her way back to the cabin. The wind is blowing. It was not blowing that day. You always have to make your own wind. And <laughs> you can't count on it. This takes us back onto stage 21 at Universal. We shot everything here in two consecutive days on the 21st and 22nd of, uh, of April. I stayed right where you told me to. Good, that's good. It worked it out so that Bix would only have to get into the makeup one day, so we shot all of his makeup stuff uh, in one day. You always try to protect your lead actors wherever you can so that uh, they get as much time off as possible. And we would schedule the, each day of filming so that uh, we would start with something else and then work our way into Bix. This is on the set, too. That was about all the set there was there, just there's a little bit of rocks on either side of the door. And again, the two-shot emphasizing the relationship and what she's learned from him about listening and watching and feeling. Now we're getting to the really big stuff. I had three helicopters to work with, although this next shot here is a little poor man's process. The foreground chopper is just above the ground and the other one is just hovering in the background uh, so that we could tie them together in a, uh, in a, a two-shot there. We copy. Where are you? The uh, radio here, of course, is being heard by Jack Colvin. This is a couple of shots of Jack that we took on the very, very last day of filming uh, on the back lot at Universal so that I could tie it in with, uh, with the stuff that was going on everywhere else. And we hear again, Prometheus is on the way in. Prometheus is coming in. Who is Prometheus? We don't know yet or what. And now they realize, oops, we've come to the wrong place. Uh, as he looks around and sees, uh, oh, Mr. Ugly, the big rock, and a big low music cue from uh, Joe Harnell emphasizing it. I like this shot that's coming up here of the rock, and then watch what comes up from behind the rock. Whoom, here comes the camera chopper looking down at them while we look up at the Tyler Mount. There are two people on the ground here. Are they normal? This was the biggest day we had on the picture. It was incredibly complex and difficult. I was working with two Jet Ranger helicopters and the Prometheus helicopter, which you are about to see. Uh, the, uh, all the wind that you see blowing them and such was really the helicopter's prop wash. The shot of Jack, all the shots of Jack were taken on, a separate, on the last day of filming uh, and intercut to make it look like he was there and watching the whole thing. Um, but I had uh, 150 extras this day, uh, the whole military convoy three helicopters uh, working. But I had four helicopter pilots. Uh, the fourth was a guy named John Gamble, Englishman, who had helped to stage all the helicopter work in Apocalypse Now for Francis Ford Coppola. Uh, I wanted to make this as safe as it could possibly be, given the difficulty and the complexity of the shoot. We were down uh, in a valley here, as you saw earlier, with the choppers working uh, overhead and overhead of 150 people, ultimately. So we had to have a very, very careful safety operation. Chuck Tamburo is the pilot in the background there. Chuck is a brilliant uh, chopper pilot who has done so much stuff for me. He's the one who flew the helicopter underneath the freeway overpass in Terminator 2. He's, uh, he's really brilliant. He did all of V for me and uh, has done all kinds of work for everybody. Here comes the entrance of Prometheus. This is the first time we're seeing it. Notice the color of the uh, chopper. Uh, again, vibrant and, uh, and big. This is a big Sikorsky. It's not as big as I wanted. I wanted a really big helicopter, but this was the biggest one we could get and find and get down here on the budget that we had to work with. And now we get the reveal of what's hanging beneath the Sikorsky, this 18-foot dome on a cable, which had to be brought out to the location that day on uh, two trucks, and one of the trucks, it, the half the dome fell off on the freeway on the way here, so I had to scramble and uh, work my way around it. Very tricky, though. We've got tail rotors and uh, of two helicopters. We've got this dome overhead, which could be disastrous to either, either of the jet rangers flying below it. Um, John Gamble was the only one talking to the helicopters, uh, and I was the only one talking to John Gamble so that we could coordinate it. Through some of this, I actually put on a Prometheus uniform, and I was right down in the middle of the action so that I could direct what was going on, see what was going on, make sure it was safe, uh, and at the same time be in contact with everybody. I like this big close-up of Bix in the foreground with the choppers in the background. The um, angles above the uh, Prometheus helicopter were, of course, taken from the 
camera chopper, which was sometimes a camera chopper and sometimes was on camera, so we were going back and forth. It had to all be carefully arranged and worked out ahead of time. I always work with a very complex shot list so that everybody knows exactly what they have to do and where we have to go. Uh, we had another camera up on the hilltop above us on a um, camera crane looking down. All the insert stuff, as this was, was shot by uh, Steve Caldwell and Alan Cassidy later on. They always enjoyed trying to find new ways to see him hulk out. I like the boot tear that we used in this one. I don't believe it. I was anxious to keep Laurie right in the middle of all of this and play it as much as I could off of, uh, of her reactions to what was going on, like this close-up here that takes us into the reveal of the convoy rolling in, so that it remains a personal story in addition to, obviously, the big drama that's going on and, uh, and Louis uh, stripping down for action here. <laughs> Uh, low angle showing both of the helicopters. Very tricky to get the shot and get all the choppers in the right place at the right time. An incredible amount of work that was done in only two days out at Indian Dunes, uh, the 17th and 18th, Thursday and Friday of, uh, of April 1980. Uh, but I want, you know, I had all of this production value and I wanted to try to capture it in uh, as many angles and uh, as I possibly could. Uh, so that it would be a, a really dramatic piece. All the stuff of Jack, again, was shot later and intercut with it uh, later on. We've heard Monty Markham's voice now say possible E.T. in the impact zone, so now we're getting uh, beginning to get a sense of what it is that Prometheus does, that they're looking for this. I was looking for something that Lou could do to bring down one of the choppers without killing anybody, and uh, uh, we had this little tail rotor, and we did this little pop here so the, it could counter-rotate. That's Chuck Tamburo acting his heart out as he spins the helicopter with Ricky Gunter sitting in there with a handheld camera. We sped up the film a little bit so that it was uh, a little more disastrous than it uh, than appeared to be, and then brought it down so that the guys could bail in a hurry and um, added a little bit of a flash of fire here, right, just as Chuck gets out, right? A little here, flash, I think, whap. Yes, and uh, then we cut to this big wide shot where Tommy Reba set off about uh, 20 gallons of gasoline that we uh, got to carry up and, and passed all the choppers. Uh, but now we're getting to the to the really tough part where we had to lower this dome on top of Lou. Now this, this I said, very dangerous stuff. And we had ca carefully done several safety meetings so that everybody knew exactly where to go and what to do if there was a problem. We couldn't really lower the dome safely down on top of Louie and uh, Lori. Uh, so what I did was instead we dropped it down very carefully with about 20 guys standing around it to guide it in on top of them. And then once we had it down on the ground, we raised it up. This shot I'm particularly fond of, the dynamic of it, very strong. So anyway, we had lowered the, the uh, dome down and guided it in with about 30 of us there, guiding it so that they wouldn't be hurt in any way. And then we lifted it up. So what you're seeing here is actually a reverse print. The film was shot the other way. The film was shot with the dome going up. Uh, and then reversed it. Then we did the lowering thing and uh, made this grunging, grunging, grinding sound as though it had scooped them up and we shot the piece being lifted up as though it had scooped up Laurie and Lou and they were inside it now. And I, I knew that on the dubbing stage with the music that all of those helicopter blades were really going to interfere with the sound of the music. So I suggested that we synthesize the sound of the Prometheus helicopter rotor blade and put it in rhythm with the music. So it's not really the helicopter that you're hearing here. It's, a, uh, it's part of the music. The Prometheus helicopter engine is part of the music. Listen to it for a second. You see what I mean? See what I mean? The helicopter rotor blade is right in rhythm with the percussion, uh, which took us to the credits for Nick Correa, my supervising producer and dear friend, and, uh, and tune in next week which took us into our closing credits for the, uh, for the episode. Nick uh, was a wonderful writer and director, uh, as well as, uh, as being a producer for me on the show. Uh, he went on to do Airwolf and Archer uh, and uh, a couple of the Hulk Returns movies with Bix later on and Deep Space Nine and Star Trek Voyager. Uh, we lost Nick on 17 January of 1999 at only 55. Very talented guy, and I really miss him.